was finally promoting my first CD, Desvelado, outside of my native Texas. The trip had me a bit nervous because I was going to another really big state, California. I'd been warned that radio in California was going to be very difficult because the interviews would be all in Spanish, not exactly my native tongue. I walk into the first interview and shake hands with a DJ, and he doesn't say anything. He starts playing my song on the radio. Voy desvelado por estas calles esperando encontrar. When the song is finished, he introduces me and I say, Hola, mucho gusto. Probably not in the most authentic Mexican accent. <laughs> and then he asks me, Eres pocho, verdad? <laughs> now, uh, pocho is a word used to describe a Mexican American that is assimilated into a Mex uh, American culture and has lost touch with his Mexican roots. I didn't know how to take it because I was actually singing in Spanish, but I told him that I was from Texas and that my Spanish was mas o menos, more or less. He then asked me in a cynical tone uh, how I expected to conquer the Mexican audience if my Spanish wasn't correct. Well, I got defensive and I asked him if he had kids. And he says, uh, yeah, where were your kids born? Here in California. And I told him, van a ser iguales que yo. They're going to be just like me. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. My kids are proud to be Mexican. I said, just wait till their friends talk to them in English and they absorb all the American culture. We agreed to disagree, and the interview ended on an uncomfortable note. As we drove off, I felt frustrated, dejected, and embarrassed by the pocho label that had been attached to me. I felt like in the movie Selena, where Abraham, played by Edward James Olmos, said, being a Mexican-American is tough. You got to be more Mexican than the Mexicans and more American than the Americans, both at the same time. It's exhausting. I had to do something about it, and eventually, I did. My radio tour throughout California was surreal. I visited many DJ booths, and there was a common denominator. I had trouble communicating with the guys interviewing me. And I also noticed that Throughout the DJ booths, I saw paraphernalia of the Mexican flag all over. I sensed they had a major nostalgic love for their homeland, something I couldn't relate to. It was then that the light clicked on for me, and I said, if I hid in their homeland, they'll accept me. Now, I know I was never going to be a made in Mexico, hecho en Mexico product, but at least it gave me a better chance to tap into that nostalgia. As luck would have it, some cinteros from Monterrey, DJs, traveled to the Rio Grande Valley for new music. They started playing my song and other songs uh, at parties and, and at clubs. And Desvelado took off like a rocket, underground. People started calling the radio stations and asking for the song, but the radio station had no idea who Bobby Pulido was or Desvelado. So they contacted us through a sister label that my label had and said, would you like to come and do an interview? I'm like, I thought you'd never ask, of course. So soon thereafter, I was on a radio tour in Monterrey, Nuevo León. Now my Spanish was still not good, but the interview, they went better because the people were nicer. I think because of the proximity that the Rio Grande Valley has with Nuevo León, they were kind of amused by my pochones. <laughs> and kind of like, okay, I get this guy. Um, but I still had trouble connecting with the people. It frustrated me. I had developed a reputation for being cortante, kind of brief. All the questions were, see, sí, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we were planning a tour, and I had, I had a gotten a crew from Monterrey to work in that upcoming tour. I said, you guys got to correct me, okay? I got to learn the language. So if I make mistakes, you got to correct me. It doesn't matter how many times you correct me. And they did, a lot. <laughs> like, a lot, a lot. <laughs> like, so much that I think they thought I was going to fire them. But I got better, a little bit better. I toured successfully through northern Mexico for that year. Then I wanted to go further. So then we went to the Bajio region 
San Luis Potosí, Aguascalientes, León, Guanajuato, and then Querétaro. After that, I wanted to go deeper. So we went to Mexico City. Now, Mexico City is a monster of a city. I had no idea what I got myself into. As, in, as goes with most big cities, the people in Mexico City were not as nice as other places. They didn't mean to be rude. It's just that big city life hardens you. People are in a hurry to do everything, and they don't care what you have to say. So I walked into my interviews, and they kind of look at me funny. Spanish surname, sings in Spanish, doesn't speak English. I mean, doesn't speak Spanish. They looked at me like I was a rare zoo animal. The Pocho Sapiens. <laughs> One notable interview that I had was with Veronica Castro. Now, Veronica Castro is this glamorous actress that is like the Mexican Elizabeth Taylor. She had a show, and she could not have been more nice to me. Uh, but I did have a major embarrassing moment. She asked me to describe an anecdota. And I said, excuse me? Perdón? An anecdota. And I had no idea what she was talking about. And I think she saw that nobody was home. So, so she said, algo que te haya pasado, something that's happened to you. And it was then that I realized she was talking about an anecdote. So I was really embarrassed. But over the years, I did more interviews and more interviews. And I got better little by little. And I, my Spanish got so good that Mexican cab drivers could never guess what part of Mexico I was from. <laughs> I'll tell you something, they never guessed I was from South Texas. But something else other than my Spanish also improved. My success in the United States. I started seeing a lot more Mexican people at my shows because of all the work that I had done. I saw the results. As of today, we have about a 60-40 split of Mexicanos to Tejanos. <laughs> Tejano, you ask, what's a Tejano? Well, I'll explain. My roots on my mother's side exist in Texas even before Texas existed. My family was part of the Spanish land grants, land given to colonizers from the Spanish government. Years later, Mexico kicked the government of Spain out, declared their independence, and my family became Mexican. Years later, General y Presidente Antonio López de Santa Ana lost the Battle of San Jacinto over there by Houston, and in exchange for a pardon for his life, granted the territories of Texas and Coahuila to the Republic of Texas. That's where Tejano comes from. Texas y Mexicano, Tejano. In the 1840s and 1850s, German and Czech immigrants brought the accordion over to Texas. And Tejanos adopted this instrument and fused it with an instrument from Oaxaca, Mexico called the Bajo Sesto, a 12-string instrument that has a more raw sound that together with the accordion goes together like peanut butter and jelly. It's a beautiful sound. It's called conjunto. That's our root music. It's still around today. After decades, conjunto music had a baby. It was called Tejano music, a spin-off. Now, us Tejanos, we speak primarily in English. Our food, very Mexican-inspired with a little flavor of Texas called Tex-Mex. We even sing in Spanish, but, there's a but, right? We don't speak Spanish very well. It's not the correct Spanish like the Mexicans. You see, the environment hasn't exactly encouraged it. When I was in the third grade, this Mexican kid, classmate of mine named Francisco, was talking to another kid in Spanish. When out of nowhere, this coach, a huge mountain of an Anglo-Saxon man spanked Francisco in the butt, lifting him off the ground, and told him, we're in the United States. We speak English here. That forever stayed with me. I didn't really want to speak Spanish after that. 
My family, my grandparents and great-grandparents, they spoke both languages. They spoke English and they spoke Spanish, but they preferred to speak Spanish at home around family and friends. Out in public, not so much. I think I know why. I'm sure that DJ in California didn't know the plight of my family and what it was for generations having grown up in a multicultural society. The same way, I didn't know what it was like for him leaving his homeland in search of a better life and having that nostalgia for his family and for his homeland that something that wasn't made in Mexico, he didn't like it. And although I would have preferred him to have been nicer, I'm really grateful to him. Because of him, I not only became more successful in my career, but I became much more culturally rich. I developed a love for Mexico, its people, its food, its music, its culture. I met my wife in Mexico City, and we have a five-year-old son named Rodrigo that hears English from dad and Spanish from mom. The saying goes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Well, I did it. And it didn't take a spanking to accomplish it. In 2022, I was nominated for the Best Tejano Album at the Latin Grammys in Las Vegas. I'd been nominated four times and never won. The day before, I was doing interviews. And in one of these interviews, this DJ asked me, why Tejano music was dying. And it really upset me. It took me back to that disrespect I had felt in California years back. I told him we weren't dying, of course not. We just needed to develop new talent. I stood about that all night. The next night, I'm hearing all the names of the nominees, mine included. And finally, I heard my name as the winner. I finally won a Latin Grammy. So I walk up there and I don't know what I'm going to say. I didn't want to jinx myself, so I had not thought of a speech. So I thanked everybody I had to thank. And I just felt the need to say this. La música tejana vive y nunca va a morir. Porque somos más que un género musical. Somos una cultura. Y yo soy muy orgulloso de ser Tejano. Tejano music lives and it'll never die because we are much more than a musical genre. We're a culture. And I am very proud to be a Tejano. I felt a lot of relief after that speech. But not because I had won. Because I was there representing my people, my culture. And yes, even defending it. I've been very blessed over the years to have earned fans from that are Tejanos, Mexicanos, and first and second generation Mexican Americans. And I can tell you, we have more in common than what we can imagine. The difference is that us Tejanos, we got a head start. Our ancestors went through all of this a long time ago through acculturation. Now, it's acculturation, not assimilation. There's a difference. Acculturation means you can be proud of who you are and keep those traditions of our ancestors alive. And at the same time, love this country, the United States of America. Love it with everything you've got. Be grateful to it. And at the same time, in many, many, many cases, also be willing to die for it. Thank you. I'm not done yet. But it's acculturation, not assimilation. Acculturation takes time, and we need to have patience. And I would be remiss if we know somebody or see somebody that looks Mexican and doesn't speak a lick of Spanish, 
we need to show them some grace. The same way if there's somebody that just got here to this country and they're trying to make their way, we also need to show them some grace because we don't know their stories. Everybody has a story. Even the Mexican boxer Canelo is trying to acculturate, albeit with cuss words, but <laughs> I give him credit. At least he's trying. Last year, I started a musical competition called Cora Fest for kids. Its goal is to help these kids provide an avenue for them to export our music and to maybe even make it big. We had kids from high school, junior high, and even elementary. 21 bands participated our first year. And I'll say this, numbers never lie. Our future is as bright as ever. We ain't going nowhere. And yeah, you can call me Pocho. Just remember that us Pochos, we have feelings too. <laughs>